Can we have the combatants please uh, come to their respective place? Kristen, uh, Bruce, John, come up here. You're, you're going to be... Uh, They did it. Eddie, Eddie did that. Uh, we're going to, uh, uh, as, uh, as Ed Mazur said, write out your questions. I mean, we know none, nobody up here is con uh, you know, confrontational or controversial or whatever other word you want. I do want to mention that two of the big Tribune hotshots are way in the back which has, a, there, I know there's a reason for it, but Mr. Kern and Mr. McCormick just don't want to join us. Uh, I don't know what that means. Maybe they're intimidated by Mr. Barron. I'm not sure. But uh, uh, just so you know, your guys are back there watching you. So just in case, don't be careful. So let's get the show rolling. Uh, we're dealing with the first year of the, of the Emanuel administration, and we're going to do this in modified alphabetical order. Mr. Dole, edit, editorial editor of the, of the Chicago Tribune, you have five to seven minutes. Make your opening statement. Sounds like a political debate or a campaign. Go ahead. Thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate Round it. Round of applause before I, they start. Everybody gets it. You earn it at the end. Are you going to interrupt all day? Yes. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. I know you're here to hear John's travel log in, in Greece. You have to catch him after the show. So I was, uh, I realized the other day, it's been almost 25 years since my first encounter with Rahm Emanuel. This was back in the late 80s when John Cass and I were young guys covering City Hall. And Rahm was a young guy sending dead fish. <laughs> and so I got a, I, I didn't know him, but I got, a, I got a call from John Margolis, who was the Tribune's top guy in the Washington Bureau at the time. Margolis says, hey, there's a guy, he's coming back to Chicago. You ought to write a profile on him. His name is Rahm Emanuel. He said, why would I write a profile about this guy? Margolis says, because he's a really good source for me. <laughs> um, I swear, not three minutes, I hang up the phone, Margolis, not three minutes later, I, the phone rings again. Hey, I'm Rahm Emanuel. I hear you're going to write a profile about me. <laughs> says, why would I write a profile about you? He says, because my mom would really like it. <laughs> I, think that, I think that says something. I think there's a, um, if, if you're wondering what, what drives this guy, why he's so frenetic, I, I think he really does want your approval. And I heard it in that first conversation. That it reminds me of uh, Ed Koch. When Ed Koch was the mayor of New York, you remember he ran around all the time. How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? Brahm is kind of this, the same way. Uh, he really wants to know every day that you're thinking that he's doing a decent job with it. I think there, there might be a couple of surprises if you didn't know him uh, terribly well. One that is, uh, if you knew him as Rombo, you might be surprised that he's He's more of a policy strategist than people expected him to be. And you may be surprised that he hasn't made more enemies. I think uh, out, outside of the, the teachers union, um, he's had a pretty good relationship across the city. Now that may change. I was talking with uh, Jorge Ramirez as we were coming in. And you know, I think we agree that the, the, the basic relationship with labor has been pretty strong. That may change when you see a pension bill this week. I think a lot of people were, a lot of people in labor were a little blindsided when the mayor went down to Springfield, didn't announce it ahead of time, came out with a pension proposal that was, that was, uh, that was pretty tough and didn't clear it with labor ahead of time. So you might see that, uh, that changing. But I, when I look at the guy and I look at over his history and how that reflects in the first year, I think he learned a lot from his time in two White House administrations. Uh, I think of one case where, remember he, he called me up once that he was, they were working a crime bill and they wanted to get an assault weapon ban included in uh, the crime bill. He called up and he had a very specific strategic agenda, which was to work on Henry Hyde. 
Henry Hyde was the, at the time the ranking Republican on, on the uh, uh, Judiciary Committee and hadn't taken a position on the assault weapon ban. He said, you know, there's a way to get to Henry Hyde. He's really pro-life. Tell him this is a way to protect the kids after they're born. You know. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, and we did. Uh, we, we were supporting the assault weapon ban, and we did work on Henry Hyde, and he did flip, and it did have a significant impact on getting an assault weapon bill through the uh, U.S. House and into the crime bill. So I think he learned he could be strategic in that. He also learned, because they lost the House. So you know, that, that crime bill winds up being passed. It was also a big reason why a uh, large part of the public turned on the Democrats, and they lost the House in the next election. So I think he saw from that there are victories, and then there are victories that can be uh, defeats. I saw that again when he was in the Obama administration, and he'll tell anybody who wants to listen that when the administration was working on health care reform, uh, the chief of staff was arguing that it should be incremental, that you needed Republican votes. I think he had that in the back of his mind, what happened to him in the Clinton administration, and saw you can have a victory and wind up having a defeat. And he may well end up be uh, proven right on that, given the blowback on, on health care reform. So he is, uh, he has a lot of uh, big ideas, but he's also, you know, likes to be an incrementalist. And I think you, so far you're seeing that in the city council. When you can, he passed an austerity budget. That was a pretty tough budget. He didn't have a single vote against it. Uh, we fought him on the infrastructure trust. Uh, still didn't like uh, the transparency on it, but he had, what, 42 or 43 votes at the end and on, on that. He hasn't had a close vote yet, but I do remember one thing he said to me during the campaign. Uh, we were talking about how he was going to work with the city council afterward, and he said it, the city council wouldn't necessarily be the problem, that he needed as much or more from the Illinois legislature as he did from the city council. And I think you're going to see that this year. Last year, you got a school reform bill that was a pretty significant bill through. Uh, this year, he's looking for pension reform. And that's going, to be, uh, that's going to be a closer vote for him. And some of those relationships that have been pretty good so far for him may wind up being frayed. I think, uh, overall, he's, he's building a foundation that has the potential to really be a game changer in the city. When I look at the agreement with the laborers union, which fundamentally changes the cost structure for those positions and also creates flexibility they've never had before. You are no longer going to be go into city government and be a rodent control specialist. You're going to have four or five different jobs that you can do. And frankly, you're going to make less than the guy next to you when he came into the, the union. But uh, he is a, that will eventually change the cost structure of the, uh, of the city. Uh, I think you saw it in that education reform bill. Um, and I think you're going to see it in pensions because he understands. Now, one other thing I said on the, on the labor fund, and competitive bidding, I think, again, something that has the uh, opportunity to be game changing. It, Mayor Daley pushed privatization, got some success on it, but you never set it up this way where you're saying you're going to have the private sector compete against the public sector and we're going to take the best see who wins. If that's done honestly, probably still an open question, but if it's done uh, honestly, uh, you can find a way to get an efficient government, something that's, you know, that's the evaded Chicago and the state anywhere else for a long, long time. Uh, there are a number of things that can trip him up. One is coming up in about three days. I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen with NATO. I think the, uh, I think the city isn't concerned about the thousands of protesters are going to come. They're concerned about 100, with about 100 people who could be in town to cause a ruckus. And they'll be watching them closely and hope that if they can keep a lid on those folks, they can keep a lid on the, uh, on the city. But nobody knows, really knows what's going to happen with that. And then again, you know, this, uh, this pension deal. I think uh, I've been really pleasantly surprised at how Pat Quinn has become governor austerity. Uh, I, I wonder if in part it's because he has seen Tody Preckwinkle selling that message. He has seen Rahm Emanuel selling that message. The, the, we finally got through in the idea that you can't have the government that you want if all the money in government is going off to 
one piece of it, you know, to, to pensions, to health care. Uh, and Rahm sold that. I, it was one of the reasons that we backed him when he ran for mayor, was he was the one candidate in that race who was willing to say, look, it's not going to be pretty. Don't think this next year is going to be uh, going to be really easy, and I think we're seeing that uh, seeing that now. So the key for him, I think, and I think the key for the state, is what you're going to do in the next few weeks in the legislature if you get state pension reform and if he can get a city component uh, to that. Um, next thing that could trip him is the school contract. I, I haven't talked to him since the uh, since the Tribune polling came out. I got to think he's probably a little unnerved by the numbers that showed the relative support for the Chicago Teachers Union on a fundamental question of school reform versus the mayor. Um, encouraging for him, and I think encouraging for the city that there was strong support for the longer school day. But what happens in this contract is really going to be key for the schools. Uh, my sense is when Mayor Daley and Arnie Duncan and the school board did the last contract. The deal was, all right, we're going to sign a contract that we know we can't afford. And the way we're going to handle that is we're going to try and marginalize that contract. We're going to do more charter schools. We're going to do more schools that are outside of that contract. And maybe if you shrink the pool that's under the contract, you, get, you, can, you can afford it. Well, they couldn't. They didn't get enough schools out of the contract. So what I see what, what Ram is doing on schools is Acknowledging he wants more charter schools, but acknowledging that every school in the city needs to be uh, developed, whether it's in a CTU contract or not. And so I expect him to push for a contract that the city actually can afford. I think what he's doing on, um, with city colleges, what he's doing with the International Baccalaureate program, those have, again, potential to be really significant things f that can be, you know, be built across the city. Bruce, and, their, to, and to close. Okay, sorry, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I knew after this it was all going to be Greek travelogue, so I, I will stop. Thank you. Round of applause. He earned it. And again, in our modified alphabetical order, Kristen Mack, who covers it, uh, why don't you take center stage and have the a loose five to seven minutes? Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so for me, I covered Rom during the campaign, which um, was a long campaign with, uh, with all of the candidates who were involved. And I thought finally after the campaign was over, it didn't go until May, it, you know, he was able to uh, seal it in February. I thought, okay, things will slow down now. And then came the transition. And I thought, okay, after that, things will slow down. Um, and, and the thing is that even during the transition, Rahm liked to say frequently that there could only be one mayor at a time, but clearly he was acting as if he were mayor already between that February and May period before he actually got um, put into office. He was down in Springfield working with lawmakers down there for the longer school day um, and sort of, you know, acting in, in that capacity before he was actually sworn in. So then after he was sworn in, I thought, okay, things will slow down now. But then there was the first 100 days. And 30 days into it, Rom had the giant poster card behind him with all of his points on there and had already checked marked 50 of the 100 things that he said he was going to do um, during the first 100 days in office. And then on the 99th day, because he couldn't wait until the 100th day to point out that he had already accomplished many of those goals that he set out for himself. Um, and again, I thought, after the, transition, after the first 100 days, things would slow down. Then came the budget. And then after the budget, now here we are sort of in the preparation for NATO, which is coming this weekend. So as I like to say, Rahm has infused City Hall with a double shot of Red Bull. And um, I don't think that that is going to slow down at all, even after the, now that we, we've reached the first year mark. And he said as much. He already. In November, after he passed the first budget, he was already making his list for 2012, for the things that he wanted to accomplish this coming year. And some of those things we already know about, the longer school day, transforming city colleges, implementing his budget goals, such as managed competition and taking the city on a garbage grid. Um, and 
and then also sort of rebuilding Chicago as part of the infrastructure trust, which he introduced and passed last month. And then the mayor, in, in the one-year interview, we, he was talking about these six bullet points that he had on his list. And he told me those four, and I asked him what the other two were. And he said, well, you know, I'm going to stop there, but rest assured that they are already long along the way of being uh, implemented already. So again, if we know in November that he had already had the Chicago Infrastructure Trust and the list of things that he wanted to do in 2012, but we didn't find out about it until March, and he's saying there are two other things which he already knows that he wants to implement later this year. It, it just, you know, it goes to show how he lays the groundwork, how he plans ahead, how he has, you know, he has something in place long before we as a public and, and reporters even find out about it. Um, and so, is, uh, Bruce touched on the, the longer school day with teachers and the teachers union contract, which is coming up. I think one of the next biggest challenges for him is going to be crime and how he sort of um, helps to reduce the, the violent crime rate. He's talked a lot about, about uh, how crime has gone down overall in the city, but we still, he still has to look at homicides and, um, and shootings because as part of Ron's overall plan, he talks about how in order to get economic development and investment, you want people to feel like this is a place that is growing, that's on the move, where we're educating children, and crime is a big part of that for him to lure business and investment to Chicago. So I think that those are the things that um, that we're sort of going to have to look at in the next year. And Ron, you know, he talks a lot about sort of everything for him is in not, not just the speed with which he moves at City Hall, but also sort of declaring everything a crisis and running it in with the solution. First, we had the jobs crisis and the infrastructure crisis and the schools crisis. And there are going to be things like that that I think continue to affect the city that he will define and help shape sort of where we go from here on out. Very good. Round of applause. <laughs> and uh, again, modified alphabetical order, we have the, uh, the president of the country of Kazakhstan, John Cass. Round of applause. My good people, thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, so Bruce and Karen took all the good stuff. <laughs> and that leaves me with the other stuff. But Rom came into office having been dealt a terrible hand. The last guy, the one that he never names, I forgot his name, <laughs> but the last one that he never names presided over a city that I think by any measure we can say is in a, was or is in a financial crisis. So given that he had this problem to deal with, I think he's done a, a remarkably good job. Um, and, but if, if Rom uses that in a campaign commercial, Tony, I have my lawyers, my bosses, everybody, gonna, they're going to testify I never said it. So he, he has done a good job. Um, is the change really, really different, though? I mean, okay, can I be the skunk at the garden party now? All right. Yeah, it's a role you seldom play. Go ahead, John. Okay. Well, so, yeah, and I, I don't know what Franklin Delano Roosevelt would say about this uh, professor, but uh, today I look at certain things that haven't changed. Um, the airports are still run by the Ms. Andalino who ran the airports for daily. And I know that many of you have uh, issues with the airports, and I... I was surprised that he didn't change, change her. Um, to me, that tells me something. It tells me that um, he's smart politically. He doesn't really want to rock the boat. He will rock it when it's, you know, when it's to his advantage. And when it's not to his advantage, he doesn't want to, um, in the euphemism, uh, mess with somebody's rice ball. And the airport is a big rice ball, treasure trove, cornucopia 
of contract after contract after contract. So we'll have to see what he does with that. As far as the politics goes, we're doing a one-year retrospective. Um, but my calendar for Rahm is 2016. I don't think he's going to be mayor for 20 years. I don't think the guy took this on as his last stop in politics. This is his, really his first public stop after being a staff guy. and a, I know he was elected to Congress. I remember the guys who elected him. Some of them went to prison. Um, <laughs> And when you said, Bruce, and you know, how you do, you know, how, how am I doing? And I agree that he's always interested. In, but I remember he was elected from the 5th Congressional District where I think the operative term is, how you doing? <laughs> how you doing? And one day at the, um, he had uh, an army of people working for him, Mr. Tom Zack. I think he's out of prison now, right, Don? Are you here, Don? Um, <laughs> So anyway, he had an army of patronage people working for him, and I remember writing about him using a, like U.S. Rahm Emanuel Democrat Tom Zack. And uh, he came to the edit he came to the Tribune one day, and we're standing there with my back was to the newsroom, and he was like near the back door, the rear doors. And he's going like this, you know, and I'm, I don't want to look at it. I'm not look, I don't want to look at the RB. I'm, I'm looking right at him. And he's like, John, you keep saying D. Tomzak, D. Tomzak. And he's, and he's, he's I was like, why are you, you know, I'm not that man. I, I'm a good guy. But if you saw him, I mean, he was very pleasant, but his hand was moving. <laughs> and he was looked frenetic. But if you saw him from, to my back, was, were all my colleagues. And all they could see was Rahm Emanuel going like this. And I thought, man, he's good, you know? <laughs> he's really good, he knows how to do it. Uh, I, I think that Rahm Emanuel will be in national office. I don't care what contracts he may have signed with another newspaper that I, <laughs> that I um, sometimes read. Um, it's a good paper, okay. Um, but I don't believe in contracts in politics. I firmly think that he will be on the national stage. I can see him as Hillary Clinton's vice presidential uh, running mate. I don't see him as Secretary of State. Uh, maybe, because then, you know, the dead fish thing will come into play. I also um, think that we have to, you know, treat him with respect. He hasn't except for the golden, you know, the, the, the camera business, what was that camera business? Somebody that he knows had a, a an issue with the, with the cameras. Um, I think he's been pretty good on the ethics. I'd like to see more transparency. And um, I think that he's going to show us, uh, show us a lot. He's been given a terrible hand financially. And um, he's always a lot of fun to cover, so we're going to have fun covering him. OK. Oh, Ginny. I would have said more, but I looked up and I see my boss and everybody else yeah, here. So yeah. if they weren't here, I really would have cut loose, okay? <laughs> All right. If you have a question, raise your hand. Young Ginny will be uh, among you to pick him up. Uh, by the way, uh, John, uh, there are a lot of people who have been elected by people who have gone to prison in this state. So, I mean, that doesn't make him uh, sui generis. Okay, while we're waiting for the questions to come in, Miss Brenda is back there as well who, by the way, just got accepted to the UIC nursing school. So we give her a round of applause. Good for her. Uh, my question to all three of you is, if in fact the next couple, we had Quinn, Governor Quinn here on Monday saying the next, he said 17 days is going to decide an awful lot. And the mayor has a lot going on in Springfield. How can you do things in two weeks that you haven't been able to do in five months or in many ways uh, 25 years. How's that going to work out? How can you put government on ROM speed uh, in, in Springfield? Bruce? All right, you got, you're right. I mean, if I had to put, if I had to bet my house on it, I'd say it probably won't happen just because that's the way that Springfield works. I think you, and that's why. So, Voices for Illinois Children. Kathy Rigg was up here a few months ago, yep. heard her speak. 
She put out a press release saying, now this is an organization that is providing basic services, pushing for basic services. And it's the first time I'd seen one of the providers put out a very plaintive press release saying, you have to fix the pensions because there's no money for the important work that we need to do. So I think the game is starting to change on that. I think everybody has to remember, the Civic Federation will tell you, if you're a Chicagoan, if you live in the city of Chicago, you're sitting on $15,000 in debt, every single person, family of four, $60,000 in debt, just for pensions, city, school, state pensions. The city's borrowed lots of other money, $15,000 per person, just for pensions. So when you see Quinn come around, I think you're seeing John Cullerton come around, Madigan was there last year with Tom Cross, uh, and, the, and the mayor is pushing on it. You've got a window to get it done this year. I think you'll see a bill this week. But it's going to take everybody in this room and everybody in the state say, you've got to do it now. It's so easy for them to try and push it off past the November election when they get off the, off the hook. You've got to do it now. So I think there's a chance. And I think, I think the fact that he's willing to invest his own political capital, as he said, to go down and appear in Springfield in person and make that, that very public push, that's very different from staying here and having your people go down to Springfield and lobby for you and work on your behalf. So with the mayor putting, as he likes to say, that sort of skin in the game to get everyone to move on his pace and to build public momentum behind it, I, I think that that certainly helps the chances of it passing sooner rather than later. John, you got a comment? Uh, yeah, I have one thing to say. Mike Madigan. All right? I mean, basically, what are we talking? I mean, he can dance and people can sing and everything, but it's what Madigan decides because he's the boss of the legislature. And if it's in Madigan's interest to move this a little bit forward, uh, that'll happen. If not, it won't. Okay, I don't know if you're, they're intimidated by our speakers or they're intimidated because if they say some, I ask a question that's negative on the mayor, that they'll pay a price, but we only have one question. Uh, I won't allow anybody to criticize a politician in my presence. Okay, you have the protection, you have the protection of John Cass. Now that, that, um, that, that counts right. a lot. That's right. Yeah. right. Here we go, Fred Schwartz, where, uh, what, Fred, that's your, Schwartz, where are you, Fred? Good. Uh, this is a hell of a question, Fred, and none of them are going to answer it because none of them are part of it. What, I'll add a word, what do you think it's like for the people who work for Rahm Emanuel? <laughs> That's what I thought. I can answer that. I, I think, you know, he keeps them working at a very unforgiving pace because you have to be able to keep up with him to, um, to sort of get things done. But Rahm, because so, for so long, he was the guy who was, you know, quote unquote, behind the curtains. He was, you know, the chief of staff, the strategy guy, you know, helping control the message. Rahm still thinks that he can do those things better than the people he has given those titles to. And so I think that, um, the, again, you have to be able to keep up with him. You have to be willing to let him play that role occasionally. But he only has people who can sort of work as fast as he can um, and maintain that pace. And even even he has said, and some of them said, you know, they went in making a two-year commitment to him, knowing that it was going to be hard to sort of maintain that over the entire first-year term. Um, I, I know a few people who work for him, and uh, there are not enough hours in the day for these people. And you know what? Why not? He, um, you work for the public, uh, you have a responsibility to the public, and he wants to work you. So if you don't like it, leave. And he's trying to do many different things on his own politics and running the city. And uh, if you don't like it, there's other jobs out there, I think. Well, we'll see if, uh, if he can keep it up and if they can keep it up. No, I, was, I was going can't. back and I was reading some of that. <laughs> you know, they, when Rich Daly I was reading some of the one year on pieces that we did on the Daly administration, it was, they were very similar. A frenetic yeah. pace, lots of ideas, go down to the legislature, barrel through the legislature the first year. Casino, um, casino, remember? Right, and big tax increase, more money for the, the city. It is tough to keep up that pace. Um, and Kristen is absolutely right. He is his own. It's got to be 
hard to be his chief of staff because he's his own chief of staff. And it's got to be hard to be his press secretary because he's his own press secretary. And he's being a press secretary 24-7. Uh, they are, um, Kristen could probably speak to this more because she's there every day. I think one of the things that, that is kind of grating to reporters is they've got this edict to find out what the news is before it's on TV or in the paper. And so they are constantly, what, what's your angle? What are you writing? What are you going to do? I don't think anything ticks off reporters more than, than that. So if I was going to say anything to the press secretary in chief, you know, it's, uh, you, have a very, you have a good press operation. They're very good at getting out uh, their take on things much better than I think, well, Jackie Herb is an old friend, but much better than Mayor Daley was himself at selling that. Uh, but take it down just a notch and realize, let the press do its job and you'll read it in the morning and see it on the 10 o'clock news. Um, uh, by the way, in the, in the spirit of transparency, accountability, and stakeholders, by the way, if you want to be a reformer, just get those three words and keep using them interchangeably. Uh, if you want to ask the question of the Sistine panel, you have to sign your name. Now, you could, you know, sandbag them, but sign your name because we don't take questions without pe people. <laughs> Except if you're a former alderman. All right. This next question is from Lawrence Massal from the Civic Federation, who occasionally knows things about this. Where are you, Lawrence? Lawrence, where are you? Raise your hand. Here. All right, Lawrence. Who, by the way, has a wonderful article uh, uh, in a new book, uh, not a new book, a fourth edition of a book on Chicago mayors that will be out shortly. Uh, who wrote it? Uh, me. All right. Uh, <laughs> this is the City Club. What do, you, what do you want me to do? All right. Here's this from Lawrence Massal, Civic Federation. Oh, this is a good question. What story, this goes to any one of you. By the way, all three of you don't have to answer. What story do you wish you had covered during the last administration, and what, if anything, has changed how you cover this mayor? Well, I think the first part of it is really interesting. What story do you wish you had covered during the last administration? I think I wish we would have covered the, um, the wrought iron fence contracts, the, uh, all that money going out to the... Uh, the, the, the tough guys with the uh, 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 paving. I uh, would like to have covered the duffs and the hundred million dollars in uh, no in no in contracts and affirmative action contracts that went to white guys. Uh, there's so many. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, we did cover them, but um, <laughs> but yeah, there, would would there have been would there have been uh, stories that we could have covered? Um, I would have liked to have done more on um, Michael Daly because I think he's the smartest of the dailies, a very bright and uh, capable man and int very interesting and I, I didn't do enough there. Anyone else? You were, were you I, around then, Kristen? No, I wasn't here then. I was well, okay, you're excused. So. I, I wish we had screamed from the editorial perspective. I wish we had screamed louder on the parking meter deal. We did. I mean, we, we wrote just as plain as we could say, don't do this. You don't know what's going on here. And the city like council rolled through anyway. I wish we had put a calendar up every day that they were, that vote was underway and, and, and done more to try and stop that deal from the start. And I think that's, there's the risk of the infrastructure trust. I mean, same issues, a little more time to consider. There's so much we don't know about what that deal is, and yet the council let it roll through. Okay. We now have a question from Rachel Goodstein. Rachel, where are you? All right, double hand. Double hand. That's a, that way you get your questions asked really early. Uh, a political question for you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. 2011 was the first. Well, it, no, we have to. The professor has to modify the question. 2011 was an open mayoral race. In other words, it was a nonpartisan mayoral contest. It was in 1995 that it started, but that's okay. That was, are there any people <laughs> acting like 2015 candidates for mayor? No. <laughs> Short answer. I, e even though we don't, you know, we, we're, it's unclear whether Rahm will in fact run for a second term. I certainly don't expect him to be a lifetime mayor, 20, you know, a two-decade mayor the way that Daley was, but I don't see anyone who at this point is willing to take him on, in fact, if he um, does run in 2015. He's got, um, right now, they're working with uh, remap issues. There's, you know, they've remapped, but 
there are other things down the pike in terms of size of our local uh, legislature, et cetera. And I think that people are afraid of him. And he plays this game well. It's part of you muscle your opposition. You, 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 um, he's, he's really good at getting people on their back foot. And that's, part, that's how he survives. That's how you survive in politics. And so right now, there's nobody leaning forward, I don't think. Do you, Bruce, do you see anybody? I think a lot, I think a lot depends on, uh, on Dick Durbin. If Dick Durbin decides to run for re-election, that closes off one opportunity for a lot of people. I think if you're Tony Preckwinkle, you're looking at possibly governor or possibly the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if Rahm Emanuel were to move on to something else, I think she would probably think of the mayor's office. There are probably a few members of the city council uh, thinking about it. Uh, but again, nobody's going to be overt about that uh, at this point. I, I, my guess that John was talking about White House, I think that's probably unlikely for Rahm. I think, if anything, he might have be interested in the governor's office. Uh, I don't think he'd take on Pat Quinn, but somebody in the party probably will. But I think, if, uh, I think he likes management, and I think he could see, um, see that as the next step. Okay. Uh, Joe Thornton for the American Medical Association. Where are you, Joe? Turn off my microphone, huh? You remember go. the New Hampshire debate in 1980, young fella? Be careful. <laughs> That's for the, uh, for the old aging baby boomers. All right. I paid for this microphone, Mr. Masadi. Uh, do you, uh, here's a question from Joe. Uh, American Medical Association. Well, this is sort of a follow-up. Do you think Rahm's ambition is local with a long term as mayor, or does he plan to run for governor after he fixes Chicago, or in order to fix Chicago, it stops. Uh, there you go. Well, that's sort of like a diagnosis that doesn't have the final uh, prescription. Yeah, uh, I, I guess we just answered that. Yes, I, you I'm did. I'm thinking probably governor. John's thinking maybe president. It's not, it's not about fixing Chicago. It's about convincing everybody he fixed it. <laughs> right? This is politics. Like a few years ago, I remember the last guy was the great uh, administrator, the great... You know, I handle, you know, I can handle this. I can handle this city, right? It was great. I, I think he's shown certainly that he has, um, that he maintains national ambition. Just looking at the way that he courts the national press, um, when he introduced his infrastructure trust, who did he give the story to first? The New York Times. Um, and again, he had, he had done he had done a lot of those things and announced a lot of those things here in the city um, first. But when he you know repackaged it and wrapped a little bow on it, he handed it to them. And you've seen um, uh, Forbes stories and Business Week and um, and Time. So he still definitely craves, I think, that national media attention and courts it. And I don't think he would do that if his ambition were strictly to remain local. How did that go over in the press room? Not so well. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> How many reporters does the New York Times have over at City Hall every day? Zero. OK. <laughs> you learn things at the City Club, eh? <laughs> OK, now, uh, former Alderman Nataris, uh, is, is your, your question about the second term, we got that one answered, is you're also the one Will Rom take on United Continental to expand O'Hare? Is that your question too? No. Well, make off it is because it's a good question and it's no name. And I'm just, uh, well, no, you're from the 42nd Ward. So here's the question, breaking city club rules, but it's a good question, therefore we break city club rules. Will Rom take on United Continental Airlines to expand O'Hare? John, you're, the, uh, you're talking about O'Hare. What do you think? You mean over their dead bodies like that? Right? You're going to do this because I said? I don't know. I'd be interested to see. I mean, they don't want it. Who's paying for it? How's it going to be paid for? I, I leave this to Bruce and uh, Kristen. I think he's shown that he's willing to. I mean, when he announced the, the $7.2 billion infrastructure program, he said that it included a new runway at O'Hare. The airlines hadn't agreed to that, but he's already counting that money as part of the total of what he wants to do. I think you've seen Smizek say very clearly that we don't need it now. We don't, you know, we, we still have to finish the expansion project before we get to a new runway. So 
I think that um, they're in the beginning stages of playing off each other to see what that looks like. It'll be interesting to see how far and how public the fight actually is. I think that one may only, that may depend on whether the business community stands squarely with him and wants to push for the, the, the full expansion. That, that only happened because the Civic Committee and George Ryan and Rich Daly got together and pushed something through to, to get that expansion deal going. If the business community has lost interest in further expansion, I don't see that the mayor will have enough leverage to do it. Okay, we have our final question for the uh, panel of three from board member Ed Mazur. The pension proposals uh, suggested by Rahm appears to have blindsided the labor union, uh, police, fire unions. If, uh, if, thrust is an trust. if trust is an objective, we gotta have print that. Where are we on this subject if trust and, and cooperation is what uh, Mayor Emanuel is seeking? Did he in fact blindside those unions? How could they be blindsided when they could read the books like everybody else? Um, blindsiding from their perspective is a posture for politics. Uh, my advice to them, concede. Because he's gonna have to make some changes and either you keep some pension or there are people that are really going to get chopped. And there's going to be some chopping coming. And um, that has to be dealt with. It's just really that, that simple. The la what happened before and the years before can't, can't exist now. And editorial boards like uh, Tribune and Bruce and Kristen and, uh, and other reporters and, and everyone in this room understands that that can't, you can't continue. It just can't. So I'm, I'm, the cut. Yeah, I'm with John. I mean, two things happen if you don't do a pension deal. As the mayor has Greece. said, you can increase your property tax by 150% and chase everybody out of the city, or you can let the firefighters' pension fund go bankrupt first. It's the weakest of them all, but they're all headed down the same slope. So I think he's positioning this as saying, look, we're trying to save your pensions here. There's one way to do that. Do it. And, and I agree. I think when it, when they say blindsided, I think it means that we you didn't unveil this plan to us behind closed doors first before you went public with it. They knew that changes were coming. The mayor had said all along what some of those changes would look like. Um, I think that they just didn't know the particulars of what the deal would be. And he's in the middle of contract negotiations now with several of the unions and they were hoping, so we know that pensions were a part of that conversation. I think that they were all just hoping to work a deal out first and then announce it rather than having him go down to Springfield and present it that way. How about a big round of applause? It's very informative.